1991 that um, a group of African journalists uh, assembled for the first time uh, from across the continent, some of whom had to be released from jail to attend the seminar in Vintuk. Um, and we got together really to affirm the importance of independent, free, of course, and pluralistic press on the continent. I think it must be borne in mind that 1991 was just after the Cold War era had ended. Uh, Namibia had become free the year before, and so it had come out into the world and into Africa in particular with a constitution which gave, um, which had a Bill of Rights, which obviously included press freedom. If we remember at the time also, South Africa was just emerging from the apartheid era. Um, they weren't entirely free as yet. Most governments on the continent were controlling both the print media and the radio. So, 30 years now into the declaration, the formation of World Press Freedom Day, and uh, the, year, the, the theme this year, Information for Public Good. Your reflections on when it started, where we are now, and in between. Press freedom is often, I say, a one step forward, two steps back approach. So democracy also on the continent is very fragile. Namibia, it's just been announced today, continues to hold the top spot in the World Press Freedom Rankings, which have been released by the Reporter Sans Frontier, which is a rather nice thing to happen, especially as we host um, this World Press Freedom Day. But I think further than that, the declaration obviously also led to a very significant historical moment for journalists globally, and that was when the UN General Assembly uh, declared May 3, the day of the Vintuk Declaration adoption, as World Press Freedom Day. Further afield, um, it was followed by similar declarations in other parts of the world, where journalists around the world began to affirm that they wanted their journalistic independence and freedom, and they didn't want to, the government controls to continue. It did, in the declaration itself, encourage, for example, African broadcasters to together and to determine their own way forward. And that happened exactly 10 years after the adoption of the Vintuk Declaration, where journalists, uh, radio journalists from across the continent adopted the African Charter on Broadcasting. And of course, the Vintuk De Declaration had also paved the way, I think, for the opening up of the airwaves in Africa, which was very significant for the people of the continent. The 180th country, which is all the countries that it considers in terms of press freedoms, is the, the worst rated is, in, is also in Africa, Eritrea, 180th. So when you look at that spectrum, what is your assessment of why um, you know, press freedom is still a real challenge to achieve across the board on the continent? It's a struggle that's never entirely won. And I mean, if I think of it, um, was it 2019, we had World Press Freedom Day in Ethiopia, and um, it was a really good time. Uh, the journalists were released from jail shortly afterwards, and it looked like Ethiopia was turning a corner. And now, of course, we look at things, and the situation has regressed quite badly. So, yes, there's this huge spectrum on the continent of some countries which are very good about press freedom, and Ghana is also one of the countries that stands out, and then the absolute worst case scenarios like Eritrea, as you've mentioned, which is such a closed country that we know so little about what is actually happening there. And kind of speaks to me to the lack of pol political will, if you like, on the part of the African Union and African governments to actually not just pay lip service. Why do you think there's such contention between journalists and governments? What is at the core of it that you can reflect on? It can be a healthy tension. Uh, it can be the kind of tension where the journalists speak out and sometimes the politicians respond. And that's not a bad thing. Um, after all, it's their democratic right and freedom of expression to, to do that as well. So one doesn't want to sweat the small stuff, um, as they say. It's difficult to say what causes this break, if you like, between media and the government, but it does seem that there's certainly some governments that just want to control and have all the power and want it to continue and don't want to have the critical or probing eye of the media 
looking at things like corruption or mismanagement or bad governance and things like that. Public's trust in the media. Uh, there are varying reports that indicate that sometimes the public does not trust the media. Um, what are your thoughts on that? If I think it's, it's probably one of the most critical issues there is right now for journalists to face and to discuss, that would be it. More and more people sort of going on, on social media like Facebook, like Twitter and others, and causing them to turn away from real news, uh, news that makes a difference in their own lives as citizens. Now that the media spectrum has opened up in a lot of countries, it's obviously brought different ownership patterns into play. And there are people with agendas who are running the media in various countries. And again, journalists need to really get a, get a handle on because it's also so critical uh, for the sustainability of what we call legacy or traditional media.